The Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. That whistle is your signal for the Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. I'm the whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales, hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for The Whistler, rated by independent research the most popular West Coast radio program. And remember... Let every traffic signal remind you, with new signal gasoline, you do go farther than ever. Look for the familiar big yellow and black circle sign that identifies those popular signal service stations throughout the West from Canada to Mexico. And now, the Whistler's strange story, The Witness at the Fountain. There were two things about Randy Dean that set him apart from the rest of the world. Basic inner things that made him different. The first one was clear enough on first meeting. He was a newspaper columnist, of course, but in a world of happy-go-lucky newspaper men, Randy was careful and methodical, living his life according to plan, scheduling each day down to the minute. No, there was nothing slovenly or happy-go-lucky about Randy. He'd mentally blueprinted his future on the first day he went to work on the Harristown Tribune some years before, and had set to work building his career like a ship. In the course of construction, naturally enough, he came to New York, took a position on the Star Express, and, according to plan, married the publisher's daughter. And now, though he was a syndicated columnist at the top of the ladder, he saw no reason to let down. The methodical planning, the schedule, still went on from major events at the newspaper right down to the problem of his white shirts. Cynthia! Cynthia, where are you? Cynthia! Yes, Randy? Come here a moment, will you? Just a minute. Put the aids on, will you, Anna? Mr. Dean will be ready for breakfast. Yes, dear? It's 7.55. You're behind schedule. I've been looking for a white shirt for the past ten minutes. Where did Anna put them? Oh, I forgot to tell you, dear. She didn't send them out to the laundry until Friday. Friday? They go out on Wednesdays. She knows that. Oh, you have to make allowances, dear. After all, the poor girl's just become engaged. Hang it, Cynthia. Her engagement has nothing to do with it. The point is that white shirts are scarce as hen's teeth, and unless she sends them out on Wednesday when she's supposed she's to... not so loud. She'll hear you. I don't care if she does. It's about time somebody talked to her. It isn't only the shirts. My gray shockskin suit is still hanging in the closet. What about that? It's Monday, darling. My suits go to the cleaners Monday morning. I've told her a dozen times. But you won't wear it again for weeks. I want it ready when I need it. All right, dear. I'll tell her. Now, you won't say a word to her about it at breakfast, will you? Oh, very well, Cynthia. I'll go and see how your eggs are coming. All right. Oh, Cynthia. Yes? No two and a half minute eggs this time. Three. <laughs> That was one of the unusual things about Randy Dean, the public one. The other, the private one, was even more unusual, for Randy was basically a criminal. The reason, for example, that he was so irritated about his shirts and his sharkskin suit became clear that very afternoon in the American wing of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. He was sitting inconspicuously with a dapper little gray-haired man before a painting by Gilbert Stewart properly attentive as the guide discussed its merits before a small group of spectators. Of Washington, perhaps his most famous, we find Stewart at his best. The delicacy of line, the careful delineation of character, expression, and so on. Let's pass on now to another example of the artist's work, the portrait of John Jay. Are you coming, gentlemen? Uh, no, no, thank you. We'll sit here a moment longer, if you don't mind. All right. Let's get it over with, Broden. How much this time? Two fifty, naturally. That's what I thought. 
who you are. Uh, thanks. Going to have to raise it, you know. Inflation. Raise it all you want. You'll still get two fifty. A rash statement, Mr. Dean, if I've ever heard one. You'll pay what I ask when I ask it. I have a career, too, you know. A career? A more honorable one than yours, at that. At least it didn't include the murder of my first wife as the most convenient way of marrying a newspaper. And poison at that. The lowest form of murder, Mr. Dean. Be quiet, will you? Oh, we're quite alone, Mr. Dean. And I feel like talking. Yes. I had a career in mind, too. You see, I didn't plan to spend the rest of my days as a laboratory technician in a coroner's office. So when the post-mortem was called on the death of the first Mrs. Dean and I discovered poison in her stomach, I said to myself, Broden, here's opportunity knocking on the door like a woodpecker. No use sending the poor man off to the gallows. He'll be grateful to you. Be happy to support you the rest of your life. You're a born optimist, aren't you? I'm thoroughly practical, Mr. Dean. And what with living costs rising and all that... You know, I'm afraid beginning next week it'll be three fifty. What? Right? I... I'll have to think it over. Otherwise, I simply write a letter back to Harristown. They'd be only too happy to exhume the body of poor Mrs. That's Dean. That's enough. All right. Now where will I meet you next week? I'll call you. Just tell me where oh, I can reach. Oh no. I'll call you, Mr. Dean. Good day. <laughs> Yes, Randy, Mr. Broden had a blueprint for his future, too. And for more than four years now, you've been meeting him secretly once a week. First it was $100, then $200, next week, $350. And all he has to do is remind you of the first Mrs. Dean to make you, uh, cooperate. Yes, in his way, Mr. Broden is just as meticulous as you are. He realizes, of course, that his career depends upon yours. And he's been very careful to keep your meeting secret so that nobody has the slightest suspicion that any connection between the two of you exists. That fact suddenly becomes important a few days later. Terry Lund of the Homicide Department is your guest for lunch at the press club. And, of course, he falls back on his favorite subject, crime detection. I'm afraid I, I don't get it, Terry. What, what do you mean, murder is a paradox? It's very simple. The more effort you put into it, the more you try to cover up your tracks, the easier it is for us to come up with the answer. Oh, now, wait a minute, No, Terry. no, no, it's a fact, so help me. I've seen it happen hundreds of times. The fancy Dan kind of killer is a lead pipe cinch. It's the stupid ones that worry us. Well, what do you mean by that? Well, we start with a corpse, right? Yeah. First, we identify the guy. Mm -hmm. Next, we start looking for motives. Yeah. Connections between the corpse and the people who might have reason to kill him. Right. Now, that's where the stupid criminal gives us a headache. Huh? Oh, sure, you're a newspaper man. You ought to know that. Just look at the dozens of little three-line fillers that you throw in at the bottom of the columns in the back of the paper. Unidentified robbery victim, man found in alley, suspected suicide on beach. Yeah? Why, every one a case where some stupid bohunk just walked up to someone he'd never seen before and slugged him and walked away. So there we are, standing around a corpse, all dressed up and no place to go. You get it? I never thought of it in that way. You, you know, that, that's, that's interesting, Terry. I, I might do a column on it. <laughs> you better let me read it first. No connection, no motive. Tell you what I'll do. I'll give you a ring next time we run into one. Let you in on it firsthand. How about it? Well, thanks, Terry. Thanks. I'd like to get in on one firsthand. <laughs> No connection, Randy. No way you could possibly be implicated should your friend, Mr. Broden, find himself in one of those little three-line fillers at the bottom of page eight. It suddenly seems so simple that you wonder why you balked at murder a second time. Why you submitted to Mr. Broden's demands for four long years. And at that point, you make up your mind. The next meeting with Mr. Broden will be his last. As usual, his call comes in late Saturday evening, and you're ready for it. But I tell you, I'm all tied up, Broden, until 11 Sunday night. I, I can't meet you at all, unless, of course, you can make it rather late. I see. How late? 11.15. But that's ridiculous. Why not make I'll it... meet you at 11.15. But don't you think it would it's be... It's settled, Mr. Dean. Now, where? 
Well, uh, oh, uh, how about uh, how about the fountain in Jackson Park? Fountain in Jackson Park. Okay. You realize naturally that it's an ungodly hour. I trust it won't happen again. Don't worry, Broden. I can almost promise you it won't happen again. With the prologue of The Witness at the Fountain, the Signal Oil Company brings you another strange tale by The Whistler. But now here's a question for you drivers to try your wits on. What three things can your speedometer tell you? Three, that is. Now, let's see. Whom shall I ask? Oh, here's Virginia Gregg, one of Hollywood's most charming radio actresses. What would your answer be, Virginia? Well, let's see, Marvin. Your speedometer tells you how fast you're going. That's one. And um, your speedometer tells you how far you've gone. That's two. But that third thing your speedometer tells you... You've got me there. What is it? You mean you didn't know that your speedometer also measures the quality of the gasoline you're using? Tell me more, Marvin. Precisely what I plan to do. After all, isn't it only logical that a gasoline that gets more efficient performance from your motor also gets more miles from each gallon? Yes. Yeah. Well, when science put amazingly increased power into today's signal gasoline, they naturally gave you quicker starting, faster pickup, and quieter, higher anti-knock. And it's because of this improved performance that you now go farther than ever with Signal Gasoline. So that's why Signal says, look to your speedometer for the best proof of gasoline quality. Right, for it takes extra quality to go farther, which explains why so many smart drivers are switching to Signal, the famous go-farther gasoline. And now, back to the whistler. So you finally made your decision, Randy. Mr. Broden's appointment with you at the fountain at Jackson Park at 11.15 Sunday night will be his last. No more secret meetings, no more blackmail, no more threats. And it'll be the stupid type of murder, the kind of crime Lieutenant Terry Lund told you it was almost impossible to trace. The kind in which there is no connection between murderer and victim, no traceable motive. Because you're positive that no connection between you and Mr. Broden will ever come to light. Both of you have been too careful to keep it a secret. But murder, even the stupid kind, is a terrifying thing. And it's hard for you to keep your mind on your work during the next few days. Harder still to sleep at night. It takes all your time, doesn't it, Randy? Just thinking about it. Randy. Huh? What's the matter, dear? You almost jumped out of your chair. You, you startled me. I, I was just thinking... Uh, about Monday's column. Well, we should forget that old newspaper for five minutes. I'm getting worried about you. Randy, I was talking to Barbara Melvin today. She and Jimmy are coming over Sunday night, you know. What? What did you say? The Melvins, dear. You knew they were coming for dinner Sunday night. You didn't tell me anything of the kind. I'm sorry, Randy. I'm. They'll have to make it another night. But, dear, it's all set. I'm sorry, Cynthia. Sunday night is out. I... I... I'm simply not up to having company for the rest of the week. I'm... I'm tired out, exhausted... Terrible pressure at the All office. All right, Randy, dear. You don't have to explain. I understand. I'm, I'm glad you do. You don't have to tell me, Randy. What? Tell you what? Why, you're acting this way. I'll simply tell the Melvins it will have to be another night. That's all. <laughs> Yes, Randy, it does make you a little jumpy, doesn't it? But you keep telling yourself it's worth it. That after Sunday night, you'll be a new man. And strangely, when Sunday finally arrives, you discover you're more relaxed, cooler than you expected to be. It's six o'clock when you stop at the corner drugstore on the way home for a box of sleeping powders. Here you are, sir. That'll be 52. Uh, you say this is perfectly harmless? Uh, oh, yes, yeah, sure. Would make a habit of it, though. Yeah, 55, 75, come on. Tasteless, huh? Hmm, almost. Might take it in orange juice or maybe wine. Uh, 
Ah, excellent dinner, dear. That steak was delicious. You might tell Anna. Hmm? I think you've been very unreasonable with Anna during the past week, You're Randy. You're perfectly right. I'll make it up to her right now. Anna! Anna! Oh, oh, your coffee, I forgot... Oh, not at all, Anna, not at all. I want to ask your forgiveness. Cynthia tells me I've been quite unreasonable, and I agree with her. Oh, oh Mr. Dean, I don't know what to say. Well, let me say it, then. I'm sorry. It's quite all right, sir. And now I think it's high time we did something about your engagement, Anna. A toast. That's it, a toast. A toast? You sit right down here in my chair. I'll go out in the kitchen and pour the wine. Oh, my goodness, Randy. I don't know what's the matter with me. I'm dead to the world, and it's only nine. Where's Anna? In bed. She gave up the ghost a half hour ago. Well, might as well go to bed. I'm tired, too. Oh, the wine, I suppose. What? Always affects me that way. You should know better than to give me wine after dinner, dear. Come on, let's go to bed. <laughs> Yes, Randy, it must have been the wine. By 10 o'clock, Cynthia sound asleep. Both she and Anna would swear you were here all night. But it will never come to that, will it? The corridor's deserted when you quietly leave the apartment and tiptoe down the hall and ring for the automatic elevator. Confound it, wouldn't you know? What's keeping that up? Thank heaven. Hey, 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 hold it, will you? Hmm, I guess somebody's in a hurry. You wish you hadn't picked the fountain. It's too exposed. Lawn stretching in every direction from the path around it. The shrubbery and trees at least 50 yards away. But luckily, the light over the fountain is blown out. The darkness will cover you. Dean, over here. Uh, dark as pitch. Why in the world you ever picked a godforsaken place like this? It's the last time, Dean. If you think I'm going through with this again... I told you it wouldn't happen it again. It better not happen again. Where's the money? Here. You want to count it, I suppose? Count it? I can't even see my hand in front of my... Oh. I told you this was the last time, Broden. It's all over now, Randy. You let him slump to the ground. Yeah, Broden. The last time. Now, his identification. The contents of his pocket. Suit label, laundry marks. It should only take you a minute. And then... Down this way, Eddie, by the fountain. Yeah. No way to run, Randy. Lawn in all directions. He'd be sure to hear you. And then you see a park bench a few feet away at the edge of the path. It's your only chance. <laughs> for the life of a night maintenance man, running around in the middle of the night hunting for blowing out bulbs. You say is that a light over the fountain? Yeah. I'll go back to the truck and get a lamp. Check. Stone cold dead in the market. Stone cold dead. Hey, what's the matter, pal? Uh, well, my, my friend here is a, he's a little drunk, I'm afraid. I, w I was walking him through the park and I... <laughs> ah, so help me, you like all the rest of them. Now, that's no way to do, pal. You gotta keep him walking. You never sober a guy up by letting him pass out on you, sitting on a bench like that. Well, he'll be all right. Oh, now, look, you're talking to an experienced drunk, brother. Yeah, let's walk him some more. Let me give you a hand. Don't. I tell you, it'll be all right. Oh, no, don't get sore about it. I'm only trying to help. Just, just let me alone. Well, you know, if it was me, I'd trot him around the fountain four or five times. And then you know what? I don't care what. Please go on. Yeah. Then I'd dunk his head right in a fountain. Yeah, that'd snap it out of him. <laughs> like that. Hey, come on. Come on, let's give it a try. Get away, I tell you, I... Stand! 
Yeah. Ain't got no 300 watt bulbs. You sure? Yeah. <laughs> He's nuts. There's a whole box of them there. Stick around, Pally. I'll be right back. <laughs> Your knees are so weak you can hardly get up off the bench as the night maintenance man walks back to his truck. You know you have about 30 seconds to get him across the lawn to the shrubbery, but somewhere you find the strength. The shrubbery seems a mile away, but finally you make it. There. There. Drag him inside. Oh, don't be that way, Julie. Come on, give us a little kiss, huh? I told you you're my big heart. Art. Art. Huh? Someone in the bush. Where? I don't want there. Hey. Hey, who's there? You sure? I heard it. <laughs> okay, my friend, I'm coming in there. No, no. There he goes. I am sure. I get... oh. Julie. Julie. There's a body in here. You thank heaven for the darkness. At least they couldn't see you. The maintenance man, that kid and his girl. They'll never be able to identify you in a million years, will they, Randy? An hour later, you're back in the apartment, safe in bed, with Cynthia sound asleep at the other side of the room. Still safe, Randy. Still no connection, no motive. Still safe. Still safe. Randy. Randy, darling. Uh, uh. What? Oh. Oh. Well, what time is this, Cynthia? Well, I hope you don't mind, dear. I'll let you oversleep 45 whole minutes. You seem so exhausted. Oh, yeah. I was exhausted. Anna's bustling around in the kitchen now, getting your breakfast. Yeah, well, better get up. <laughs> mm. Randy, you're a sweetheart. Hmm? You know, sometimes I tell myself I'm married to an old stick. Then you surprise me like you did last night, and I know I'm wrong. Last night? You made a new woman out of Anna. It was a nice thing to do. What are you talking about, Cynthia? Apologizing to her that way, dear, and the wine. She was almost in tears. Oh, that. And believe me, it works. You don't catch flies with vinegar, you know. She got your cleaning off this morning right on the dock. And there's a big sign on the kitchen calendar. Laundry Wednesday. <laughs> well, I, I hope she keeps it up. Huh? Better bit. Better get going. I'm never going to get to work. Oh, that reminds me, Randy. Hmm? Terry Lunn called. What do you want? Well, I don't know. I told him you were asleep, and he said to have you call when you got to the office. That's all he said? Why, yes. Is it that important? Why? So white as a sheet. <laughs> Police headquarters, Sergeant Baker. L Lieutenant Lund, please. Just a minute. Lieutenant Lund. Uh, Terry, this is Randy Dean. Wow, Rip Van Winkle in the flesh. First time I ever caught you in a hay. What <laughs> happened to that schedule? Well, you better talk to Cynthia. She let me oversleep. <laughs> what, what's on your mind? Oh, our friend, the stupid murderer. You said something about wanting to get in on the next one. Oh? Oh, we got one. Kind of bum example, but I thought you might be interested. Guy got knocked off by the fountain in Jackson Park last night. Strangled. Oh, is that so? Yeah. You got any leads? Leads? <laughs> Brother, we got the guy. Uh, what do you mean? That's what I mean by a bad example. This time the killer was too stupid. Uh, maybe you'd rather wait, Randy. Might be something more interesting turning up. No, no, Terry. I I'll be right over. Whistler will return in just a moment with the strange ending of tonight's story. Meantime, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the many of you who have dropped me a line telling of your experiences with Signal products or of little extra services you've enjoyed at dealer-owned Signal service stations. Mr. A.M. Stevens, for instance, of 7274 Fountain Avenue, Los Angeles, was kind enough to write. As a former independent businessman, an automobile dealer on Long Island... May I express my appreciation for the service I received on my first visit to a signal station. 
Now, my car had scarcely come to a halt at the pump when the attendant wiped off the windshield. Now, then he asked about the air and water. After offering all the service he could, he finally got around to selling some gasoline. But perhaps this is, is not of the ordinary for a signal dealer, as Signal seems to realize that the, the man at the pump is one of the most important men in the organization. Uh, the signal dealer at 7318 Sunset Boulevard certainly lives up to your claims by showing as much interest in serving a customer as in selling him. It's a real pleasure to have your car serviced by dealers like this. And from now on, I'll be with Signal all the way. Thank you, Mr. Stevens. Signal Oil Company is genuinely grateful for such expressions from the motoring public. Letters that make independent signal dealers want to do an ever better job of caring for your car. And now, back to the whistler. There was no connection between you and Mr. Broden, Randy. You repeat it over and over in your mind as you hurry across town to Terry Lund's office in the homicide department. No connection. No way they could link you with the murder at the fountain in Jackson Park. And yet Terry told you just 15 minutes ago that they had the killer already. Some itinerant, perhaps. Some wayward bum who happened by at the wrong moment. Well, no matter. Mr. Broden is out of the way and a bum goes to the chair and that's that. Ten minutes later, you lean back in a chair and try and appear unconcerned as Terry goes over the story you knew so pretty well nice already. Maintenance man sees the two of them sitting there on the bench. The killer pretends the dead man is drunk, you see? Oh, yes. Uh, we just went over the records at the cleaning plant, Chief, and found out the cleaner the suit came from. Oh, good. Where? At the uh, elite cleaners on 86th Street. Shall I call him and get the guy's name? No, we better go out there. Uh, get a couple of men. We'll be down in a second. Mr. Dean will go out with us. Right. So the guy bluffs it out, and then when the maintenance man goes back to his truck, this guy tosses the body into some bushes and runs, leaving the world's best witness behind him at the fountain. That's what I mean by too stupid, you see? Witness? What, what do you mean, a witness? Yeah, he might as well have tied himself to that body with a pair of handcuffs. Well, come on, let's go. Wait a minute, Terry. Tell me what... He was all through the minute he left his suit at the cleaners this morning. What do you mean, witness? The bench, Randy, the park bench. With a nice coat of wet green paint. Next Monday at 9 o'clock, the Whistler will bring you another strange tale. The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment by the marketers of Signal Gasoline and Motor Oil and fine quality automotive accessories, and by your neighborhood Signal dealer. Featured in tonight's program were Howard Duff and Margaret Brayton. This program, directed by George W. Allen, with tonight's story by Harold Swanton, music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. That whistle is your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler. This is Marvin Miller speaking, reminding you to look for those familiar yellow and black circle signs that identify those popular Signal Oil stations throughout the West from Canada to Mexico. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>